It's been nine weeks since we closed down the campus of RPTS, and we have felt the pain of that separation, especially for our seniors who haven't been able to spend their last days at RPTS under the, under the gables of Rutherford Hall. And so we wanted to at least open it up a little bit uh, today and give us this one last uh, chance to worship together. You know, self-pity is really not the way of Christ or the way of the Christian, and we need to remember that. It'd be easy to feel sorry for ourselves that we can't have our regular graduation ceremony, but uh, we need to keep things in perspective, as uh, Dr. Williams just said a moment ago. Um, I was reminded of that. Uh, John Mitchell, who does work for us up in the archives room on the second floor, has sent me an excerpt uh, from a seminary report of 100 years ago during the time of the Spanish flu. Let me read just a brief a portion of that, give us a little perspective here. On account of the prevalence of the Spanish influenza, the work of the seminary was discontinued from Tuesday, November 19th till Tuesday, December 3rd. Mr. Carothers was taken ill on Wednesday, November 13, and died on Monday, December 2nd. It is not possible for us to fathom the mysteries of divine providence. To us, it seems a great loss to the working force and the cause of Christ that one so gifted and as well equipped for the work of gospel ministry should be called away just as he stood on the threshold of licensure to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. As he was the only member of his class, there are no students to be licensed this spring. So that's sad to think about. Sad that a student passed away, that there was a death due to the flu, and sad as well to think that there was no gospel ministers being sent out uh, that particular year into the, into the church. Thankfully, God has spared us from the illness, and uh, we're graduating all together in our three different degree programs, uh, 28 students uh, this year, uh, probably one of the largest classes we've had. And so we have every reason to give thanks that despite some of the obstacles that we've gone through and many of the things that we miss, the Lord is still uh, blessing us. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've missed the most is this, is uh, I, I've missed it the most being in chapel and worshiping and praying with you. And so I'm thankful for this opportunity today. And I want to bring to you a word from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, uh, verses 19 through 23. And I want, to, particularly with the seniors, the graduates, uh, to leave you with the words that Jesus gave his disciples in verse 21 when he said to them, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Even so I send you. Let's hear the word of God. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Let's ask God to bless this word. Our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that you have recorded these sacred stories for us in the pages of the Holy Scriptures. And we're so thankful for this reminder of our Lord, what he's done for us, what he's given to us, and what he asks us to do. And so we pray, O oh Father, by your Spirit, as we spend this time together reflecting on these words, that you would use them to prepare our hearts for what comes after our PTS. Especially, I pray that for our graduates. 
Hear our prayers, Father, for I ask it through Jesus. Amen. Our God is ascending God. He's ascending God. It's of his very essence, of his nature. The eternal Father, the almighty God, eternally generated his Son, and he could not keep his Son to himself. And he sent him into this world that he had created, a world that had fallen and rebelled against him. He, he sent his Son into this very world in order to redeem us and many others. He's ascending God. And the eternal Father and the Son eternally spirated the Holy Spirit. And again, they, they could not keep the Spirit to themselves, but from the very heart of God, He sent His Spirit to this world, His Spirit to the church, to give us all that we need. And that's what Jesus is saying here, even as the Father has sent me. So even so, I am sending you. Our God is the sending God. And the church is to be the sending church. That's just the nature of the church, is that we are to be sending people. I recall that one of my mentors in the faith, Dr. Roy Blackwood, when I was a seminary student, and I spent that summer with him. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times that summer I heard the, the motto of Second Reformed Presbyterian Church of Indianapolis and the explanation of what it may, meant. Four words that I heard Roy say over and over and over again. We are a, a reaching, training, building, sending church. And he meant that we reach people with the gospel, we train them in the holy faith, we build them up so that they can serve the Lord, and then we are to be sending them out into ministry, and they, and they lived up to that uh, ministry focus. Even today, Roy's gone, but that church is still a sending church. They just sent a team, as many of you know, to India with one of our graduates. They're sending Andrew to Pakistan, Zach to South Sudan. That's, that's just the nature of the church. We're to be a sending church, and it's the very nature of the seminary, isn't it, as we partner with the church. You know, we grow quite fond of you here. We, we would like to keep you here. And every time that we start thinking about sending you away, it brings a great deal of sadness. But that's part of our job, part of our calling here as the seminary. This morning, I was praying with five guys that I've been meeting with this year in a practicum. And it crossed my mind early on in this that each one of us was, or each of them was from a different country. And this morning, as we were sharing about our plans and praying for one another, we realized that pretty soon oceans are going to separate us, thousands of miles between us. And it's hard to send people away that you dearly love, but our PTS is a sending seminary. And so I want you to hear these words of Jesus this morning when he says to you, even so, I send you. What is he sending you to do? You have three holy obligations that we can see here in this text that he's sending you to do. He's sending you to celebrate the wonder of the Lord's day, to breathe in, breathe in deeply of the Lord's spirit, and to fulfill in his strength the Lord's commission. And so I want you just to reflect on that with me here for a little bit of time. The Lord is sending you to celebrate the wonder of of the Lord's day. The disciples were scared. They were self-quarantined, <laughs> locked behind doors. And what they feared was not a virus, but that the Jews would do the same thing to them that they had just seen them do to Jesus, that they would be crucified, they, they would be put to death. And so they were scared, they were terrified. There had been those reports of an empty tomb. A couple of them had seen it, but they still hadn't put it all together and then on the first day of the week, as they're there in fear, Jesus appeared to them in his resurrected glory. And twice he has to say to them, as recorded here, peace to you. Peace to you. And in the midst of all the fear, find strength 
and the peace that I have now brought to you. He lets them touch him, see his hands, his side. Other gospels tell us even his feet. They had to realize that Jesus Christ was alive. And we're never to lose that sense of wonder of that first appearance of Christ. It should strike us and, uh, with newness again and again and again. The Lord who was crucified and buried is risen. And because of that, peace has come. Your sins have been put away. The grave has been conquered. There is victory for the people of God. Nothing can conquer Christ. And history itself has been structured in such a way that that has become the focal point. In the Old Testament, the Jews had their Sabbath at the end of the week because they were always looking forward to the Messiah who would come, the Messiah who would bring them peace. But now he has come and he has risen on the first day of the week. And in the New Testament, the uh, life, the Christians know that that's their Sabbath because that rest has come from our sins and that peace has come to us from God. And so we worship on that first day and spend the rest of the day just looking back at peace with God for what he has done for us. And we can never lose that wonder of the Lord's day, the wonder of Jesus Christ himself. The apostles didn't lose it. We see them preaching it in the book of Acts. And sometimes I think, I, I've been going through a Bible study through the book of Acts, and every now and then one, someone will ask me as we go through the book of Acts, how long after the resurrection was this? And we're, you know, into about 15, 20 years after the resurrection. And you see the early church can't stop, can't stop marveling over the fact that Christ was raised. My preaching students know, I tell them this all the time, but I got to tell you one more time before you leave. Over half the book of Acts is sermons, and every one of those sermons is focused on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're to be preaching. That's what we're to be celebrating in this world. The early church has done this and did this, and, and, and it's been done throughout church history that Christians would come together for worship and say, Christ is risen, and expect the response, he is risen indeed. Maybe we need to practice. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Praise God. He is risen. And this virus has taken away some of that wonder from us, the ability to celebrate the resurrection like we are called to do. And I don't know, ultimately, the mind of God and all of his providence. But part of the judgment of this virus is just that, that we as the church are not able to gather as we ought and as we would like. And could it be that part of the message is to us from God that we don't appreciate what we had like we should. And that we need to work diligently in these coming days because there's a lot of fear out there. A lot of fear to restore the Sabbath day. And in restoring it, to, to, to breathe in some of the wonder and the joy and the delight this day is to be. To reflect again and ask God to help us to marvel over the fact that his son died for us, but the grave couldn't hold him, and he was raised for us to give us life and salvation. That's, that's in part what you're being sent to do. <laughs> to help us with that, we need to breathe in deeply of the Lord's spirit. Breathe in deeply of the Lord's Spirit. At any time, it'd be kind of gross to breathe on someone. But 
lot of you have face masks, wear face masks these days, and today you breathe on someone, you can get arrested. But Jesus breathes, the scriptures tell us here, on his disciples. And it's because he's, he's bringing in his, his new order, his new creation. It takes our minds back to when he first breathed on man. When he breathed on Adam there in Genesis 2, verse 7, and brought this man that he had formed out of the earth to life through his breath. And now in his resurrected state, he's breathing on the apostles to give them this new life of his Holy Spirit. And it's interesting, he, he breathes on all of them. He breathes on them collectively, not merely as individuals. It's a reminder that the Holy Spirit resides in the church and the people of God. As, as Paul told the Corinthian church, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? And that's something else we should marvel at and celebrate over and, and breathe in deeply of is the fact that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And we should never lose our awe over that either as we worship. Church fathers didn't, such as Gregory Nazianzus. No sooner do I conceive of the one and I am illumined by the splendor of the three. No sooner do I distinguish them than I'm carried back to the one. When I think of any one of the three, I think of them as the whole. And my eyes are filled, and the greater part of what I'm thinking escapes me. I, I cannot grasp the greatness of that one so as to attribute a greater greatness to the rest. When I contemplate the three together, I see but one torch. And I cannot divide or measure out the undivided light. And don't we see the beauty of the Trinity here? As the Father has sent me, Jesus said, so I'm sending you, and he breathes the Spirit upon them. And we all three persons are, have worked together to bring us life and salvation. And the Holy Spirit is with us. He has consecrated us and set us apart as the body of Jesus Christ, the bride of the Lord. And we need to never forget how ultimately dependent we are upon the Holy Spirit of his grace. And we need to, to breathe in deeply of that spirit. We need to pray earnestly to God to grant us his spirit in fuller measures we need to be like the Apostle Paul who prayed for the church at Ephesus in chapter 3. And he asked, as he bowed his knees before the Father, that the riches of his glory may be granted to you so that you'll be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. And why did he want the Spirit of God to, to strengthen the church at Ephesus? So that they could be filled with the love of God that surpasses comprehension. And when God's people begin to be filled with His Spirit, when they begin to grow in their sense and their understanding of the greatness of God's love for them as revealed in Jesus Christ, when that just begins to overflow in their souls, it just starts flowing out to other people as well. And it helps us to fulfill the commission that the Lord has for us. That I'll talk about in just a second. But I want to remind you of something Owen said. Owen, in his treatment on the triune God, when he's talking about how God dispenses grace to his people, he reminds us that the Father has the authority to declare who will receive that grace. That his Son did all that was necessary to make available, as he called it, the treasury of his grace. But it's the Holy Spirit of God who makes that grace come to his people and we receive its immediate efficacy, his presence, his strengthening, that sense of love. 
You know, we are to be experiential Christians, or as Keith Evans would say, experimental Christians. We are to be those who sense and know the presence of God in our life. If you've ever, if you've ever preached, or if you've ever gone into a meeting where there's confrontation that's going to take place, or if you've knocked on a door, you can't do that recently, but if you've knocked on a door and you're getting ready to share Christ with some stranger that you don't know, wherever it may be, you know. You know that when you walk in obedience with God, there comes times where you can't explain it, but there is a sense of God being with you. <coughs> or maybe it's a time when you're low, isolated, apart, exiled we sung about. And when you feel no one else is around, God reminds you of that covenant promise. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The Spirit of Christ with his people. And we need the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill the, the last obligation that Christ puts upon us. We have to fulfill and strength the Lord's commission. He he blesses them in verse 23 with this holy commission. Listen again. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. That's a mysterious sentence. It's a head scratcher. We might want to ask here the question that was raised in Mark 2, 7. Who can forgive sins but God alone? We, we know only Christ can forgive sins. But what we realize that Jesus is saying here is that he is granting to his apostles the declarative power of the gospel. Calvin explains it well. When Christ enjoins the apostles to forgive sins, he does not convey to them what is peculiar to himself. It belongs to him to forgive the sins. This honor, so far as it belongs to himself, he does not surrender to the apostles. He only enjoins them in his name to proclaim the forgiveness of sins that through their agency he might reconcile men to God. That's what we've been granted. Not a magisterial authority that the Catholic Church wants to claim, but a ministerial one where we declare, based on what the apostles have left for us in the holy scriptures of God, the conditions by which a man or a woman or a child may be forgiven of their sins. And that's an incredible power, incredible responsibility that we have, that we are to be representing Jesus Christ here in this world, telling people whether or not they have been forgiven of their sins. What a responsibility. What a responsibility you men who are going into the pastorate have to do that and to lead your session well in doing that very work, in helping people to know whether they've been forgiven of their sins or those sins are still held against them because they haven't repented, they haven't believed in Jesus as they ought. And what a responsibility all of us have to be in the church, to know those conditions and to tell people of those conditions in the church. And friends, this is what the world needs right now. You know, everyone around us thinks that what the world needs right now is a vaccine to help with this bodily virus. That's what we all need right now. But we know that this virus does not kill everyone. But there is a virus that kills everyone. And it damns their souls to eternity if they're not saved from it. And this virus, it even killed our Lord for three days. But he has the power to conquer it. And he has the power to save anyone from it who hears the gospel and repents of that sin and trusts Jesus 
to deliver them from it. And you have what they need. You have been trained. You have, you have studied the gospel inside and out here at RPTS. You have been given opportunities to use the gospel in counseling, in evangelism, in preaching. You have been sharpened. We have done all that we can do, really, for you in three years of time. And now it's time for you to get out of here. It's time for you to go. And it's time for you to just carry that tremendous sense of responsibility, but wondrous privilege everywhere you go with the word of Jesus in your ear. Even as the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for the clarifying words of the Lord that they come into the midst of confusion and fear and bring light and clarity and strength. And how thankful we are, O oh God, that even though the Lord left this world and you are now seated, O oh Lord, at the right hand of your Father, you did not leave us as orphans, but you sent, just as you promised, your Holy Spirit to the church. And we thank you for the knowledge of his presence in our life and for the strength and boldness and power that he can give to us as your people. Oh, Father, as these dear ones go out into this world, some will be going across oceans and into dangerous situations. Others may go into places where they won't fear necessarily for their physical safety, but they will encounter demonic forces against them. Oh, Lord, how I pray that as they go, that you would go with them and strengthen them as you've promised. And may their lives and their ministries be testimonies to the power of you, our sending God, strengthening your people to offer even the greatest sacrifice, if necessary, the giving of their very lives. Father, please bless them to that end. For I pray and ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. From tonight, uh, May 22nd, at 7 o'clock, we will be having our graduation ceremony online, a video of it. So we want to encourage uh, you and anyone who's watching uh, to go to our Facebook page or look for announcements and uh, have some watch parties. And even though you can't, uh, we can't all be under the same roof, roof celebrating together, uh, let's all celebrate nonetheless with a closer circle of family and friends. So thank you. <laughs>